Welcome to Skinner and Chalmers Weekly Roast. Today, a taste of educational psychology, motivation, self-concept, and more delicious theories. Welcome back to another episode of Skinner and Chalmers Weekly Roast. Your go-to podcast for everything under the sun. It's the 18th of March, and I'm Principal Seymour Skinner. And joining me again today is our favorite superintendent, Chalmers. Hello, Skinner. Always great to be here. And I must say, your culinary skills never cease to surprise us. What's on tonight's menu? So today, we would like to talk about a topic that is very close to both of our hearts as teachers, namely, exciting things from educational psychology. Ah, yes. Hopefully you can learn something new out there from today's episode, regardless of whether you have own children working with them or simply as knowledge about yourself. Something like this is always exciting and useful. But before we dive into the topic, I just want to let you know, Chalmers, that tonight we're having something truly unique for dinner. It's a fusion dish inspired by my recent visit to the local university, Memmerfield University, that is. You know how they love their memes there. So I present to you the Triple Decker Burger Memeticus Maximus. Skinner, you never fail to entertain us. I'm looking forward to it. But now, let's dive right into today's topic and not worry about our meal for later. Today, we want to discuss educational psychology, so why not starting with the concept of achievement motive? Ah, yes. The realm of achievement motives, according to Heckhausen. Intriguing stuff. Through and through. The theory is not only used in schools to promote motivation in the classroom, but also in organizational and management areas. That's right. I've heard about that, too. Ultimately, we are all characterized by motivation. People can't just sit around doing nothing. They always want to do something. Definitely. But according to Heckhausen, it depends on whether you are motivated by success or failure. Success. Motivated students have it more favorable because they choose tasks that match their own level of difficulty. You could therefore say that they choose realistic goals. They also attribute their own successes in an internally variable way. Here is an example for easy understanding. Let's assume our daughter Meadow gets a very good grade in biology. With a favorable causal attribution, which means where the cause of the performance is seen, Meadow would say yes, I made an effort and got a good grade as a result. So she is not saying, I am simply gifted or untalented in biology, but she knows that her performance is the result of her own efforts. The reason for failures, on the other hand, is seen as too little effort or simply bad luck. Both are a good and healthy attitude because it would be fatal to simply take a lack of talent as the cause of poor performance. Ah, yes, and I can see why. If you see a lack of talent as the cause of failure, then you are less motivated to learn or to engage with the subject. For example, biology. Because there's nothing you can do about the talent itself. You either have talent for it or you don't. Fortunately, you can theoretically learn anything if you use the right learning strategy. But yes, if children or people in general have the attitude, I can't do it anyway, then of course that's not conducive. That's right. And that's exactly why the failure-orientated don't have a healthy attitude towards lifelong learning. Such children often choose tasks that are either far too easy because they know they can do them, or they choose tasks that are far too difficult because they are then automatically given the alibi. Yes, that was too difficult anyway. I couldn't have done it anyway. I couldn't have done it anyway. Oh yes, you can see why such a cause of failure in the absence of talent can be so unhealthy. According to Wainer's attribution theory, such a case would be described as an internally stable attribution, precisely because the cause of the failure is seen as being within oneself and unchangeable. Exactly. Exactly. And now imagine the consequences if students are not supported in changing this unhealthy attitude. You don't even want to think about the negative consequences this can have for your own self-concept, self-regulated learning and motivation in general. That's exactly why teachers and parents should intervene. So, called reattribution training can be carried out in the classroom. The aim is to develop an internally variable cause. 
and effect relationship so that failures are attributed to a lack of effort and not to a so-called lack of talent. Children can also be supported in choosing suitable and realistic tasks. Oh, yes, and don't forget Covington's theory of self-esteem. Important for you parents out there, if your children bring home poor grades for some time, there can be many reasons for this. Above all, because in today's society, we often link self-esteem to success. It is possible that children simply want to protect themselves from this and therefore refrain from learning altogether or create alibis. Covington calls this self-handicapping, A.G. Starting learning late because the children can then say, well, I started learning very late. No wonder my grade isn't great. But yes, that's just one explanation of many others. Motivation problems can have many causes. If you have any concerns, simply talk to the children openly or ask the teachers for advice. That's right. We also earn our money for it, so feel free to talk to us teachers. <laughs> yes. Now, I wonder if we could apply this theory to our little town of Memofield. Imagine Bart Simpson aiming for mastery instead of constantly causing chaos. If children are so disinterested in lessons, we should probably start collecting ideas from the teaching staff on how to increase motivation in lessons. Because the rule of thumb is, it's not the pupils who should adapt to the school, but the school to the pupils. Yes, imagine Bart studying for his final exams instead of pulling pranks. But seriously, understanding students' achievement motives can help educators tailor teaching strategies accordingly. Absolutely. For instance, students with strong mastery motives would benefit from challenging tasks and immediate feedback, while those driven by recognition might respond better to public praise or group projects where they can showcase their skills. Well, speaking of recognition, maybe one day soon I'll receive some public praise from you, Skinner, for being such a fantastic listener during our podcast. Public praise? For you? Who? Never thought I'd live to see the day. Haha, <laughs> but let's continue. Recognizing and understanding what drives our students is crucial for effective teaching. Speaking of which, there's another interesting theory. The expectancy, value theory of learning motivation by Eccles. Oh, please do tell more, Skinner. I'm all ears. According to Eccles, students' motivation depends on two factors. Their expectation of successfully completing a task and the value they place on doing so, or handling the subject they want to learn about. This model helps explain why some students may put in greater effort than others when faced with similar challenges. The expectancy. Value theory of learning motivation by Eccles states that our motivation depends on two key factors the perceived probability of success or expectation, and the value we place on achieving the task at hand. So, it's all about how much we believe we can succeed and how much we care about doing well or are interested in the topic we want to learn about. That sounds quite logical. Absolutely. Let's break it down further. Our level of motivation represented by M, is directly proportional to our expectation, multiplied by the value. So it looks something like this. M equals E times V. So if I understand correctly, increasing a student's perceived ability to succeed and attaching higher importance to learning will lead to increased motivation, right? Exactly. Teachers play a vital role in shaping these expectations and values. By providing clear goals, offering support, and creating an environment that fosters learning, we can significantly impact student motivation. I see. It's like building a foundation of confidence and relevance for each student based on their individual interests and abilities. Quite fascinating. Precisely. Personalized learning experiences are key to tapping into students' intrinsic motivation. When they connect what they're learning to their own lives or passions, magic happens. Who knew education could be so motivational? I mean, that's what school should be about. To make learning fun and prepare young people for a life in a democracy. Because, as we all know, ladder is unfortunately in danger these days. True! And remember, even the smallest step towards personal growth and interest can make a world of difference in a student's life. And who knows? Perhaps one day we'll witness miracles. But wait a minute, something is ringing a bell. In educational psychology, we also talked about the self-concept of children and young people back in the day. So, is the self-concept essentially the same as expectation in this model? I mean, 
if someone has a positive self-concept, wouldn't they expect to perform well in most tasks? You've hit the nail on the head. Self-concept does play a significant role here. A person with a high self-concept believes in their ability to tackle tasks successfully, which positively influences their expectation. This in turn increases their motivation. Fascinating stuff. Now, what about the value aspect? How do positive and negative values influence motivation? Can you give us some examples? Of course. Positive values include intrinsic motivation and importance, while usefulness adds to the equation. For instance, if a student loves history and finds studying fascinating, that's intrinsic motivation right there. If they need good grades to get into their dream college, that's importance. And if they want to help their family understand historical events better, that's usefulness. And negative values, what could those be? Negative values involve cost. Costs are anything that may discourage a person from performing a certain action. For example, if a student thinks that spending too much time on schoolwork will keep them from hanging out with friends, that's a cost. Or if they think that no matter how hard they study, they won't excel because of their socioeconomic background, that's another form of cost. So, let's say a student loves art and hates math. They suddenly have to calculate how much paint they need for a project. Their interest in art is intrinsic motivation, right? And calculating paint needed is usefulness. In this way, you can combine both art and math and at the same time show the student that maths is actually necessary in everyday life. Oh, yes, exactly. If you combine interests with the topics you teach, great things can happen. We should also keep the situated approach in mind. In short, it says that we always acquire knowledge in context. If knowledge is only acquired in artificially designed textbook tasks, students will never have the idea of applying this knowledge in the real world. Otherwise, they will only acquire inert knowledge that can be recalled but cannot be used to solve problems. This is an important reason why problem-orientated learning plays such a major role. But to come back briefly to the expectation, value model, there is also the social environment to consider, which affects expectation and value. Now, these influencing variables, social reality, socializing agents such as parents or teachers, personal traits, previous experiences, affect a person's subjective perception and interpretation of expectation and values. These interpretations can greatly impact performance, related decisions, efforts, and performance. Well, Skinner, it seems like we should start cooking more often. We might just motivate you to improve your culinary skills if we tell you how delicious Cosmo would find your dishes. Oh, come then, dear friend. Oh, charms, my dear friend. I appreciate the thought. But remember, Cosmo is always ready to taste any new creation. Just don't forget to add a bit of love and effort, and voila, a masterpiece. But wait a minute, Seymour. Not all motivation is the same, right? Ah, uh, yes. There are various forms of motivation. Let's start with the extrinsic motivation and dive into those subtypes according to DC and Ryan's self-determination theory. Please do, Skinner. I'm all ears. All right, first up is external regulation. This involves behavior driven by direct external pressure, such as threats or rewards. It's like when someone says, do this or else, or do this, and you'll get this. Got it. Uh, next up must be interjected regulation. You mentioned that earlier while we were brainstorming about the today's podcast episode. Indeed, interjected regulation occurs when people act to avoid inner feelings of guilt. Imagine doing something because you think highly of yourself for being disciplined or avoiding a guilty conscience. A simple example. Imagine Sonic learning a new sprint technique. Society expects him to be fast and save the world. Sonic could then put himself under internal pressure because otherwise he would feel guilty if he didn't develop his skills. Makes sense. Makes sense. Lastly, there's identified regulation. Explain that one, please. Of course. Identified regulation happens when individuals identify with their own goals and values. They pursue activities because they genuinely believe them to be important and meaningful. For example, our daughter Meadow is learning more maths because she wants to achieve her A 
levels so that she can start an apprenticeship, for example. She knows that maths is important for achieving a good, uh, level. Wow. That sounds quite similar to intrinsic motivation. In general, there is also a fourth form of extrinsic motivation in the model, namely integrated regulation. But the last two are difficult to separate in practice anyway. What's the difference between these two and intrinsic motivation anyways? You're absolutely right, Chalms. The key difference lies in where the motivation stems from. Intrinsic motivation comes from within oneself, driven by personal enjoyment or interest in an activity. On the other hand, identified or integrated regulation originates externally, yet the individual identifies with the goal or activity. Got it? Got it. Now, let's not forget about explaining intrinsic motivation in general. That's when people engage in an activity simply for the pleasure of it or due to personal satisfaction derived from accomplishment. Ex Extrinsic motivation, on the other hand, always has a goal outside of the action itself. For example, when you, Skinner, grow corn in order to be able to cook something tasty at the end. You don't like gardening itself, but you want to achieve a goal with it. Absolutely, my good friend. And now just imagine Cosmo purring away while I cook. Could that be intrinsic motivation at work? Only you, Skinner, could turn cooking into an intrinsically motivated activity. Thank you, Chalms. I'll take that compliment as another form of motivation. But we should let our listeners know that there is more to the self-determination theory by DC and Ryan. From what I understand, it also revolves around three basic psychological needs. Autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Sounds fascinating, don't you think? Indeed it does. Chalmers, the self-determination theory is like a fine wine, complex and full-bodied. These three needs, as you said, serve as the cornerstones upon which human motivation rests. Autonomy speaks to our desire to feel in control of our actions and decisions. Competence relates to our need to feel effective and capable. Relatedness addresses our yearning for connection and belonging. Some fascinating stuff, Skinner. How do these needs impact our motivation, then? Can you give me an example, maybe? Absolutely, Chalmers. Let's take relatedness, for instance. When individuals feel connected and valued within a group or community, they tend to experience greater motivation and a stronger sense of purpose. For example, imagine a student who feels accepted and supported by their peers and teachers at school. That feeling of belonging fosters intrinsic motivation, making them more likely to engage actively in learning activities. Hum, I see where you're going with this. Now, how about competence? Does that mean people are motivated when they feel skilled enough to tackle a task? Bingo, Chalmers. When people believe they possess the skills necessary to complete a task, they're much more likely to put forth effort and stay engaged. It's very close to the expectancy we've talked about earlier. Remember the expectancy value theory of learning motivation by Eccles? So think of a student who feels confident in their math abilities. They're more inclined to raise their hand in class, participate in group projects, and seek out new challenges. Conversely, if someone lacks confidence in their ability, they may avoid tasks altogether, leading to decreased motivation. Intriguing. Lastly. Autonomy. Do you mean that people are more motivated when they feel in charge of their own actions? Spot on, Chalmers. Autonomous motivation stems from a sense of volition and personal choice. When individuals perceive they're acting based on internal values rather than external pressures, their motivation tends to skyrocket. For example, a student might choose to be more active in lessons because they are given a choice to choose between several tasks, rather than just complete one task given by the teacher that everyone has to solve. Very good point, Seymour. The diversity of learning objectives should also be mentioned at this point. There are also other models, for example, Wember's model, which states that a class can be extremely heterogeneous in terms of learning requirements. As a teacher, you should therefore not set one learning goal for everyone, but adapt it individually. High achievers need more stimulation and harder tasks so that they also recognize their own limits and see that not everything just comes to them.
and lower achievers need more support in order to reach the basic levels and still be successful at school. I couldn't have said it better myself, Chalmers. Well, Skinner, my friend, you've really nailed down the essence of this theory. It seems that satisfying these three basic needs plays a crucial role in maintaining motivation levels across various domains of life. Yeah, by catering to students' basic psychological needs, educators can foster intrinsic motivation and promote self-determined learning, to put it all in a nutshell again. Providing choices and opportunities for learners to express themselves fosters autonomy. Encouraging experimentation and giving positive feedback, like in style of Hattie, nurtures competence. And creating a supportive environment where learners feel connected and valued addresses relatedness. So it's all about making sure our students feel in control, capable, and part of a community. That sounds like a winning combination. Precisely. When these three fundamental needs are met, students tend to exhibit higher levels of motivation, engagement, and overall well-being. Well, Skinner, it seems like we should start treating our students like gourmet dishes. Give them some autonomy to choose ingredients, allow them to experiment and improve their culinary skills, and create a warm, inviting classroom atmosphere so they feel part of something special. You got it, Charms? You can never have too much cooking metaphors. It's always a pleasure discussing these topics with you. After all, what's better than spending an evening dissecting theories before having a delightfully burned dinner? Indeed, Skinner. As long as we keep the conversation engaging, nothing can dampen our spirits. Not even a slightly charred main course. Well, the podcast episode has already become quite long, but we should definitely take another brief look at the self-concept. Oh, yes. There's so much more to explore and tell our listeners. Ever heard of the Shovelson model? Oh, indeed, Skinner. Ah, the Shovelson model, a gem of a theory. It suggests that the self-concept has a hierarchical structure. Picture it like a pyramid, with each level representing a different aspect of ourselves. At the broadest level, we have global self-concept, which encompasses our overall beliefs about ourselves. This includes things like, I am intelligent, or I am kind. Fascinating. And what about other levels of the pyramid? Glad you asked, Skinner. Moving down the hierarchy, we get domain self-concepts. According to the model, these focus on two specific areas, an academic self-concept and a non-academic self-concept, which includes a social order physical self-concept. For example, a person might think, I am a competent programmer, or I'm a caring parent. Wow, Chalmers, that's quite a comprehensive view of the self-concept. It's fascinating how these different aspects of self-concept interact and influence each other. It's like a complex web of interconnected beliefs that shape our identity and guide our behavior. Understanding this structure can help us comprehend why certain behaviors or thoughts persist, despite efforts to change them. So true, Skinner. The self-concept is indeed a powerful force shaping our lives. Now, I'm truly curious, do you think there's any way to alter or enhance one's self-concept? Ah, a great question, Chalmers. Researchers believe that through experiences, feedback, and self-reflection, we can modify our self-concept. For instance, participating in new activities, receiving positive feedback, or re-evaluating past failures can all contribute to updating our self-concept. It's a bit like remodeling a house. You don't tear everything down. Instead, you make changes and additions that reflect your growth and development. That's incredibly insightful, Skinner. Reminds me of a famous saying, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. It's our repeated actions and experiences that shape our self-concept over time. Brilliantly put, Chalmers. Just goes to show that every seemingly mundane action we take could be shaping our self-concept in profound ways. Who knew that my burnt banana flambe for today's dinner could lead to such intellectual feasting? Indeed, Skinner. Your culinary adventures always provide fertile ground for stimulating conversations. But, well, let's not bore our listeners any longer with psychology. You are dismissed for today. 
Thank you for your attention and see you at the next session. Ha! You couldn't have said it any more awkwardly, Skinner. Oh, I was only joking. No, seriously. Thank you for listening. You enjoyed these kinds of episodes. Let us know in the comments. We're happy to talk about scientific topics that might actually teach you something. Oh, yes, it's nice to talk about something like that. But, but well, that's enough for both of us for now. We still wanted to cook. So, as always, have a nice day and see you next time here on Earth today. Goodbye, everyone. See you next time.